Welcome to our latest and our final C-Band Lunch and Learn of 2020. Uh, I'm Curtis Dean with uh, Community Broadband Action Network, Todd Kielkoff also here. And uh, we wanna thank you for joining us for this edition. Uh, we also want to uh, thank our guest uh, who we'll be uh, getting to here in just a second. Uh, that is Jim Baller and he is with uh, Keller and Heckman Law Firm also with the uh, CLIC, which is uh, Coalition for Local Internet Choice. And we're gonna be talking about legal issues in broadband public private partnerships, which I abbreviated to PPP because that's just a lot of, a lot of words and it wouldn't fit on this slide. I really wanna thank our C-band vendor members uh, in 2020. These are the companies that uh, have uh, facilitated us to be able to do a number of activities. Not as many activities in 2020 as we would have liked to, of course, due to uh, COVID and coronavirus. Uh, we weren't able to do our uh, couple of annual gatherings this year because of that. Uh, we're hoping that uh, uh, we'll all get our vaccines and we'll be ready to get together at least by next fall for a uh, C-band broadband summit, which is uh, our largest annual event. Um, but these are the vendors that have made this all possible in addition to um, what they're doing now, uh, what we're doing right now, the other events uh, that we uh, put on. So thank you to these our CBAN vendor members. So today's topic is, as we mentioned before, legal issues in broadband public-private partnerships. And Jim Baller is here with us. Jim is certainly a friend of uh, municipalities. Jim, you have been um, jousting windmills for how long in this in this uh, municipal broadband world? I began to work with APPA and a growing list of its number members in about 1993. So that's that's going on 28, 29 years or so. And it's been a great ride. I love this community and have had uh, many years of great fulfillment from doing what I do. It is a lot of fun, isn't it? Uh, and it's right. good It's good, and it's very rewarding work because you know you're making a difference in the, in the health and, and vibrancy of communities that are involved in, uh, in broadband. So, uh, Thank you for being on. We're going to talk about one specific topic in one specific area of a topic. Public-private partnerships are a, uh, uh, gr a highly growing interest uh, among communities. Um, here in Iowa, where uh, Todd and I call home, of course, we have a lot of municipal telecom utilities, and that's a growing number too. But we still have a number of communities and uh, entities and public entities where maybe a municipally owned and operated utility is not the best option for them, or there's just no pathway to get there. So public-private partnerships are another way to accomplish a similar goal, which is better broadband for all. So uh, we're going to be talking about public-private partnerships when it comes to uh, municipal broadband, but we're also going to specifically be talking about some of the legal uh, issues and challenges that come up on there. Now, before we uh, go any further, I just want to let everybody know uh, and, and kudos to Jim because uh, he was part of a group that created this uh, 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 wonderful white paper. You should be seeing it on the screen right now. It's called The Emerging World of Broadband Public-Private Partnerships, A Business Strategy and Legal Guide. And this was uh, created uh, in May, 2017. You can see the Benton Foundation and Click were the co-sponsors of that. Maybe Jim, talk a little bit about Click and why everybody on this call uh, should be uh, participating and joining it. The Coalition for Local Internet Choice battles for the right of communities to have a significant, indeed the most significant say in what happens in their community surrounding broadband deployment, adoption and use. We formed CLIC at the time that we were challenging the laws of Tennessee and North Carolina before the FCC and uh, CLIC built support for the factual uh, premises under which we were uh, challenging those laws. And um, uh, it's over the years grown to more than 600 members, including public and private uh, organizations of various kinds, where there are uh, state laws uh, that are being proposed to impose barriers to local choice. Uh, we pull our public and private members together and say, this is not a battle between the public private sectors. This is 
economic development, education, and so on and so forth, uh, where states have existing barriers and there are local efforts to try to remove them. Uh, we support that as well. Uh, the COVID experience has, um, it, it's terrible on so many levels, but one thing that it has done has been highlight how important a robust and affordable broadband is for all aspects of life. And uh, Click is uh, going to be actively involved in uh, promoting uh, local options that states and the federal government may be considering in the years ahead. Great. Well, this, this white paper that I, I just showed a minute ago, we're gonna make that available um, to everybody uh, that's Curtis, on the call today. Um, it's, it's a good read. Uh, Curtis, can I uh, suggest also, we've just issued a brand new one. Oh, great. And uh, this one focuses on the um, public investment, private service over the public investment. Um, I'll be glad to send you a link and in, I encourage you to share that with your members as well. That would be great because that's where a lot of these triple P's that are being discussed are going, right? Publicly owned infrastructure, privately deployed services. So, um, And you'll see that we talk not only about that model, but others as well. Uh, and uh, these are fresh, they're current. Um, they make a good backdrop for the conversation that you and I are going to have today. Fantastic. The, the, the white paper we referred to earlier is only three years old, but three years in broadband years are a lot longer than that. So it's great that you've updated that. Right. And, and the main difference is the focus on the particular model and the uh, case histories that will help guide readers to what's actually going on out there. Absolutely. All right. Well, I want to remind everybody that we've got our Q&A window. Uh, if you, that function, if you would like to ask a question uh, of any of us, uh, myself or Todd or Jim, of course, uh, the main event here today, um, you can click that and I'll be monitoring those and we'll share those as we go. Uh, we certainly want this to be an interactive discussion. Um, no, no dog and pony show today, no big slideshow, just uh, us talking here. And then um, you can also use the chat window to do the same thing. And I'll be monitoring both. All right, Jim, so we're really going to zero in on some of the legal challenges and issues with these public-private partnerships for today's discussion. So let's kind of start with overall, what are some of the, you know, the what are some of the, uh, shall we say, the, the, the roadblocks, or maybe a better word is the guardrails, uh, when it comes to whether communities can do anything or not, and, and what they can or cannot do? Are there federal laws, state laws, local laws, what, what, what is it? What goes into that? Okay, let's start with breaking down the legal issues into three stages. Okay. In stage one, uh, and I'm going to speak from the perspective of a local government as opposed to a private uh, partner. Right. Uh, all right. So first, the local government needs to understand what it can and can't do. Federal law is generally supportive of, of community broadband and public-private partnerships. And the real play is at the state level because federal law does not authorize the provision of uh, communication services or other roles. You have to look to state law. State law uh, has um, two different kinds that are relevant here. One are specific laws that address communication services, as you have such a law in Iowa, and uh, every state either has specific laws or they have um, uh, rules like Dillon's rule and home rule that uh, determine what local governments have the power or, or don't have the power to do. A number of states, and probably right now, most states in the country also have general public-private partnership laws that you also have to look and, and layer. So step one is to find out what the guardrails, as you put it, are in terms of what you can and can't do. Step two is the pre-negotiation pre planning in which you look at um, all of the considerations that you have 
on your side and that a private partner uh, might bring in. If I can, if I can step back from the legal and just put this in Absolutely. into the greater context of give and take. A local government, if, if I were starting now, here's what I'd do. Um, first thing I would do would be to do a, um, a baseline, a do, a do it yourself plan baseline. Not that you're necessarily gonna become a provider yourself, but do that as a baseline to figure out in a perfect world, assuming that you think providing service yourself is the perfect, here's what you would do. Mm -hmm. And be aggressive in gathering information about such things everywhere you can. So much of it is available free on the internet from uh, uh, communities that are already doing this sort of thing on reports, pro and con. Uh, there's a lot of history out there, a lot of information that's useful to gather. And in this context, also do the inquiry that we just talked about, uh, getting your bearings on what you can and can't do as a legal matter. Aggressively look at yourself and look at your community. What are your needs? What are your assets? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Um, what, um, what are your priorities? What are the politics? Uh, who are your local champions? Pull all that together to give you a sense of what you are looking for, and then honestly ask yourself, where are the gaps in what you can and can't do from an organizational standpoint, from a, a technical standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a legal standpoint? Be brutally honest with yourself. And then um, at that stage, if you still feel that there's there's a lot at stake here that you want to do. What we found is that it makes sense to do a process. Sometimes it's called a request for information. Sometimes it's called a request for qualification. Sometimes in uh, other places it has other names. You put it out there and basically you say, here we are, here's what we want come and partner with us if you can be helpful. And you very carefully outline, you sell your community to the world of potential partners and you tell them what your needs are and what you want them to provide to you. This process is informal. You don't have to comply with strict procedural requirements. You can engage in conversations one-on-one -on -one with folks who provi pro provide you information that could be of, of value to you. You might find that your initial conception changes over this as you get information that refines what you can do, what the provider can do, why a particular provider would be a better one than another one. At the end of the day, uh, you might find that uh, you've now got an idea that is specific enough for you to go to a request for uh, proposals, which is more formal. You have to be very careful about procedural steps, but by then you may have a very good idea of what you're looking for and a request for a formal process may relieve you of complaints that uh, the process was unfair, it didn't comply with the procurement requirements and so on and so forth. That process has worked well in a number of ways. Let me give you some examples. In um, uh, College Station, Brian uh, put out an RFI, the, the local incumbent was so frightened by the seriousness of having to potentially compete with a strong partner that it said it would make that, this was the cable company, that it would make that community its very first gigabit community in the country. Uh, now, College Station and Brian are thinking about going their own because that hasn't happened, but that's a reaction that sometimes occurs. Um, in Fresno, California, for example, uh, the RFI produced 12, 13 responses and the city said, hey, we, we, we went into this looking for a single partner, half a dozen of these things 
our proposals that we can work with. And it in fact went ahead and uh, worked in various ways with multiple others. And sometimes the process does uh, result in the identification of a partner that really works. I, I've spoken for a long time. But, oh, that's fine. But I hope this is, you know, a, a good enough answer to your question. Absolutely. Yeah, we found that, um, you know, that community prioritization is really a key component to the process um, that, that really focusing on what a community wants um, and trying to then relay that information to leaders in a way that they can take action on it. I think sometimes people get stuck in the process of collecting it and not so much the prioritization. And so, you know, that's a tricky Tricky uh, facilitation to do sometimes. Do you have any tips for people that are trying to kind of work through, you know, this grid that we have to put together in terms of uh, everything that's in that white paper? You know, there's criteria that you have to have to think about. Well, think of think of this as a uh, process of defining yourself as a community. Uh, you know, it reminds me back. You may remember in around uh, 2010, 2011, Google launched a community uh, fiber for communities program with a request for communities to uh, offer to be a model test site. Yeah. Uh, in the course of working with uh, Google on that RFI, I suggested a question that would give the, uh, the communities an opportunity to give a narrative of why, what they were looking for. And those were the most, to me, interesting responses that came out of that whole process. At the one extreme, some community said, if you don't come and partner with us, we're gonna die. And that was, that was not uh, a response that uh, didn't have merit. It, it, in their view of themselves, it had uh, reality behind it. Sure. At the other end of the extreme, there were communities, uh, Baltimore was one of those, for example, who said, you know, this process has gotten us looking at ourselves. And frankly, we liked what we saw and we're gonna go ahead with this, whether you join us or not. But if you do join us, we're gonna really do great. And, and so that's the range for communities. If they view this as a process that can really build their community, it can turn out to be great for all concerned. It's not just a problem that needs to be solved. It's a process that leads to a vision that solves that problem. But during the process, you'll discover there are other things you can accomplish that you hadn't even thought of when you yeah. first started. That's interesting. And, and who your neighbors are and what their needs and what their strengths are. And you can, you can through this process, look at yourself uh, holistically and comprehensively. Uh, where are your digital divide issues and how do you solve them? Where are you now and where do you wanna be five, 10 years from now and what's the path to getting there? It's a beautiful process mm -hmm. if done well. I know you guys are great at it. Well, thank you for saying that. We appreciate it. Um, it, it. It is a process that there needs to be buy-in by that community and those community leaders and champions, um, as opposed to just saying, here, consultant, <laughs> solve our problem for us. It's got to go a lot deeper than that. Yeah, and the key is you know, to bring in a help the community figure out that the energy is going to bring in you know, an economic development partner as well as, and that can be done well, or if it's done poorly, then it's just not an asset, you know, to the extent yeah. that it could be. Uh, but again, it's just like we said, setting expectations through that process also about the community yeah. finds out what it wants, but then, you know, you're raising the bar and the expectations um, and that get, needs to get communicated. So then you can not only evaluate, but you can uh, attract the right one. Right. Right. What are, what are some of the best practices that you've seen with communities when they're evaluating, okay, let's say they've gone through this process, 
they realize that the best way to accomplish our goal and fulfill our vision here is to partner with someone or some entity within the private sector. What are some best practices on the process of choosing that partner or partners? Okay, so we've talked about the RFQ, RFP mm -hmm. uh, process. Now, that's not the only way to identify uh, potential partners. Uh, your consultants will know about them. Uh, you can find them on the internet and so on and so forth. But once you've got to the point where you have a live entity sitting on the other side of the table, and it could be more than one entity, you could combine communities and do this jointly on a regional or uh, multi-local basis and so on and so forth. And so um, you, uh, you work toward developing a, a term sheet on what a partnership would look like. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a very, um, I won't say it's a very long process, but it should be a detailed process because you're going to be talking about uh, what the, the status of your community is from a technical standpoint, uh, what your demand is, what your supply is, what your competition is. You're going to talk about all of those and what the role of the two parties or more will be in addressing that. There are funding sources of many kinds out there, some available to public entities, some available to private entities. Um, some can be layered on top of one another. You need to talk about how that process can work. Uh, if, you are, if you're a community and you're looking at this situation from the standpoint of your own community and surrounding communities and so on and so forth, You've got to think about organization and governance. Uh, there are lots of these things. Best practice, I don't know if there are uh, something that you would catalog and say best practices because it, it ultimately needs to go back to what works for the particular community. Right. Uh, that's why we call ourselves Coalition for Local Internet Choice because there are so many choices True. that are all rooted in what works for the community, because if it doesn't, the project won't work as well as it might otherwise. You mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit about um, uh, a couple of examples that you gave us of communities that have been through this process. What are, what are some of the ones that you really identify as a success story that have gone through the process that we're talking about with public-private partnerships? I couldn't wait for that question because I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna tell a war story that's going to top, hit on so many different aspects of this uh, in a in a I, I hope you'll find an interesting way. Uh, back in the middle 1990s, uh, Virginia passed a law that imposed barriers on municipalities uh, providing service. Uh, or even using infrastructure to support competitors of the local incumbent carrier. And um, one provision of this law said that if you've already got a network, uh, you, need, you must sell it, but you don't have to offer it to the incumbent. So you can imagine how that legislature was thinking. Uh, we were working at the time with a city called Lynchburg, Virginia, that had invested three and a half million dollars on a fiber network that connected up the school system and the local government. And when this uh, law hit, the question became, well, how do we sell this network in a way that benefits the community? So we launched a nationwide search for potential partners and we came down to a list of about six and we brought them each to Lynchburg to uh, tell the city what it can do and so on and so forth. And these meetings would have the public works, uh, other agencies of government, the city and regional economic development organizations, the school system, some of the leading uh, employers in the city. And you know, we'd start talk, we'd, we'd have a meeting, someone would raise an idea, someone would take the idea and build on it before, before long, the ideas would be circulating around the room 
levitating the table. In one of these incidents, one of the proposers um, listened to this and she's watching the ideas circulating in the room. And finally she stood up and she said, I've got it, I've got it. I know what this community needs. You need a chips factory. And to give you an idea of how the state of economic development was at the time for communication service, the regional economic development representative said, no, we've got one, Frito-Lay. For those of you who don't know that, that's a potato chips <laughs> manufacturer. Yeah, it, they, don't, they don't run very fast as processors. I don't think. In any event, we ended up negotiating a deal under which the city sold its network for $1. And what it got back was, um, number one, uh, a 30-year irrevocable, indefeasible right to use the fibers that it was already using for 30 years, eight fibers on each new run in the city, a commitment to get the lowest rates for telephone service in the state for a period of 10 years, a commitment that the provider would make internet available to all addresses in the city within four years with a specific timetable and deadlines within those four years. Uh, $500,000 in the provider's uh, equipment discounts and $200,000 worth of free uh, engineering advice. And I guess that, that turned out to be a very uh, great um, partnership that's still in effect and working well for all these parties uh, nearly a quarter of a century later. But that's, that's just a war story I had to tell. <laughs> there are many successful examples of public-private partnerships across the country. Um, I will refer you to the paper that uh, Curtis is going to make available to you later for a discussion of uh, several of them. Super. Well, the provider in the term in, 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 that Lynchburg chose to sell their network to, was that a provider that already had a presence in the market or were they going to be new to town? They uh, were in Virginia um, about a hundred miles away. Okay. And what was primarily in it for them was that they wanted to expand into the region and cross through the region to what was going on the other side of Lynchburg. So this was for them a, uh, a strategic um, a, a strategic move that had value beyond the specifics, which sure. reminds me of another point that's worth considering. And that's um, that both parties to a good public-private partnership don't necessarily have a symmetric view of the value of components of the partnership. A community can value the contribution to economic development and education and digital equity, much more so than the private provider. Right. And it could well, well be willing to give advantages to the private provider that have in, at the end of the day, great value to the community, but, but those same values aren't the same to the private provider. And you're really cooking when you can find a situation where those asymmetric benefits Align so that everybody is getting what they need for their particular purposes. Yeah, we've also we've often talked um, with communities about many of the benefits of a project of this nature don't ever appear on a balance sheet anywhere. The, those intangibles the, that lift and grow the community that you can't point to and say that was worth fourteen thousand dollars. So yeah, it's certainly important. Um, I would imagine. In, if you look at the part, public private partnerships that are out there today, um, are any of them cases where it was an incumbent already in that community that said, we'll partner with you? Um, yes, I gave the example of uh, College Station and Bryan, right. uh, where the uh, private provider stepped up and that was already there and said they would um, 
uh, step up their act. Um, we have um, in uh, Springfield, uh, Missouri, for example, CenturyLink is going to be uh, or is partnering with the, the uh, electric utility, the public electric utility, city utilities of, of Springfield, where city utilities is going to expand its fiber network and CenturyLink is going to provide service or expanded service over the, over the network. Uh, that's a, a model somewhat similar to the one in um, Huntsville, Alabama, mm -hmm. where Huntsville is uh, building and expanding. Uh, again, that's a municipal electric system that's expanding its fiber and Google is going to be uh, the initial um, provider over that system and others can use it. So uh, this is a uh, model that uh, has many shapes and forms, but uh, incumbents in um, a growing number of cases are saying, uh, why not us too? We, we eventually need to go to fiber. Let's, let's cooperate rather than compete. On the other hand, uh, as you know, the pattern has often been as it has been with pure municipal builds that incumbents uh, do oppose and they find a number of ways to oppose, including, um, including arguing that uh, something has gone awry, uh, that somehow the community is favoring a partner over uh, someone else creating an unlevel playing field uh, or uh, has failed to follow procedures carefully or has violated some sort of um, uh, financing uh, mechanism, uh, issued bonds in a way they shouldn't. Um, for some incumbents, they believe that uh, their interests are served more by delaying or uh, disrupting competition than it is to roll up their sleeves and invest in good service. Um, I, I'm, I'm always uh, optimistic and I'm hoping that the level of discussion in this particular age where we are recognizing the vast important importance of broadband to just about everything that's important to communities uh, will accelerate by a number of years, how fast we get together as a nation with the public and private sectors working together for a change rather than yeah. at odds with each other. Yeah. Um, have you found in your experience that when you get to that implementation phase of the discussion that, you know, it's really marrying up um, some financial resources that are changing. In other words, and, and what we've seen is that once you open the discussion up about a partner, then the partner gets to understand that you're looking at 15 to 30 year assets and plans, and maybe their expectations were always in the past on the shorter side, mm -hmm. uh, compared to communities that's out on the long side. And then part of that facilitation is getting enough information shared <laughs> that you can meet in the middle of that ex expectation. Have you figured out any tips um, on how to get those two parties to open up about their financial expectations? Well, that's, that's critically important. And uh, in my experience, um, let me express a limitation. In my experience, uh, I am uh, we, our, our firm, our practice is on the legal side and the financial aspects of a deal, the technical, the uh, uh, non-legal issues are typically handled by uh, consultants such as you are. And what we view our main role is to make sure that parties are discussing these issues and arrive at a meeting of the minds on right. what they're doing. And our great challenge is to document what those expectations are on both sides 
and to make sure that our client has a mechanism for addressing the situation if things don't work out as the parties hope they will work out. So to give you an example, um, in uh, Illinois, uh, there's a project that we refer to as the UC2B mm -hmm. uh, project um, that uh, built out in, uh, in Urbana and Champaign, Illinois, a network uh, with BTOP funds. And um, the cities didn't want to operate a network they built a public-private partnership. The uh, private partner was doing just fine when its parent decided to sell off its assets. Uh, we had built into the agreement a right of first refusal, mm -hmm. which as it turns out, uh, the city found that it didn't have to exercise because it found another provider willing to step in to the shoes of the first provider and do even better for it than the first provider would have done. So um, Todd, you're right. It is critically important to get as close as possible to identifying uh, what the parties are thinking short-term, long-term, what their uh, escape routes might be if things don't work out and, um, and document them. One of the things or one of the challenges, Jim, that a public entity might find in, in working on a public-private partnership is because you are a public entity, you have one set of rules about meetings and records, and confidentiality, and the private company has a different set of rules. And, and so I would imagine there's some cautions that a public entity need to follow when, when doing engaging in that conversation to make sure that they are doing everything in, in accordance with sunshine rules. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And in the uh, uh, framing of the nature of the public-private partnership, rules like that need to be uh, taken into account. And the question becomes, uh, what exactly is the role of the public entity in that process? Uh, is it, is it, at the governance level? Is it at the operational level? How deep does it go into it? And to what extent uh, do uh, local uh, requirements on uh, disclosure uh, allow for confidentiality in the sense that the organization is behaving like a private business? Um, and you know, these are, these are built into state laws that differ from right. place to place. Uh, some states explicitly say that a, a local government acting as a business have the same uh, exemptions that a private entity would have. Others are much less generous than that. Uh, I, I would add that uh, when you look at the laws across the country, there are a great many potential uh, pitfalls that you, you have to be very careful of and avoid. So for example, in some states, there is a ban on public entities providing communication services. Right. And if, it, if the law stops there, uh, that's, uh, that's something you can work with. You, you, know, you can arrange the partnership so that the private entity is uh, the one that's providing the service and so on and so forth. Then there are laws that said that you can't, that municipalities can't provide uh, services directly or indirectly. And now what do we mean by indirectly? Okay, and you know we've experienced organizing things so as uh, to comply with that standard. But this just gives you an idea of, you know, the kinds of nuances that you must root out, be aware of and stay clear of uh, because uh, there are uh, quite often ways that you can move ahead lawfully if you know about them in advance and uh, take them into account with your uh, planning process. I, I also assume that you encourage your clients to keep 
revisiting those routinely because it's it's interesting that the I think the private sector thinks that governments are just you know on top of all their agreements, but you know from a lot of times we consultants get called in when there's been benign neglect of the process by which things are being looked at and are the values the same or the you know are things even being followed that were the original intent uh, and it's just the nature of of the world that you know especially that's when tra when staff transitions at the city level and they forget why these things are are done and no one goes back and looks and says oh well we just haven't done that agenda setting you know the right way over the last five years to talk about why we might have a values change now or secrecy or you know the financials uh things like that you just need to revisit those goals and processes once a year uh, so yes. so the transitions happen well because well, I, companies get taken over I, and i would not only agree with you as to uh revisiting i would certainly emphasize visiting in the first instance because you might find you've got plenty of authority at the state and local level but lo and behold you've got a poll attachment agreement that gives the poll the entity uh language that says you won't compete with them mm -hmm. or the provision of services or you know stuff like that and you need oh, to root this stuff out at the you know at the front end too to make sure that you have addressed appropriately any kinds of uh, issues like that that may exist out there. It's a lot better to find those before they happen than when you've gone down the path and invested a lot of time and money and energy in uh, doing stuff that you could have done differently and avoided the problem. So you mentioned pull attachments, which is kind of a form of uh a form of right of way or public easement, mm -hmm. but what are, are there any cautions about in a public private partnership in, in the public body is that manager of the rights of way, manager of the easements that a public entity could be a, uh, accused of basically playing favorites for a partner versus maybe an incumbent that is not partnering? Uh, you, um, hit on several different issues with that uh, with that point, and every one of them are good points. Number one, uh, pole attachments, private easements, uh, other infrastructure issues are are very important to build into your discussions early on. Favoritism is a um, a core issue, and the question is, what do you mean by it? Right. Um, so, uh, for example, if you have, um, if you're, if you've got a relationship with a private partner, and others had the opportunity to have that relationship, or a different relationship, that's one thing. If they haven't, that's not necessarily that doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, favoring the one that that you're working with. Um, do they have equal access to the public rights of way uh, and can do the same thing themselves? Uh, there, there are any number right. of questions that go into what favoritism is. Bear in mind, equal treatment is not the same as non-discriminatory treatment. Mm -hmm. It is discriminatory to treat similarly situated entities the same way or differently, I'm sorry. It's discriminatory to treat similarly situated entities differently, but it's also discriminatory to treat differently situated entities similarly. Did, did I get that out right? Yes, either way, you have to look at the circumstances and decide what is reasonable under the circumstances taking the differences in the situations uh, into account. Um, I mentioned easements, they're very important. You need to know uh, if your project is going to be uh, using uh, private property, if it's going to be over private property, that you have uh, easements that allow for the particular use that you're planning on, and if not, you've got to make arrangements uh, 
uh, as early as possible with the holders of rights in those situations. Um, bottom line, there's a lot to do, but these things are doable. You just need to um, uh, accept that you're, you're going to be working in a complicated process and commit to doing it. Others have done it successfully and, and maybe you can as well if you've got the champions and you've got the endurance and the, the um, importance of what you're doing firmly in mind. It's, it, is a, it is a process and I think one important key there is understand going into the process, it's not necessarily a fast process. It right. takes a long time in many cases to go through these steps with the due diligence you need to create an outcome that everybody's happy with. So right. just want to remind everybody, if you have a question, you can uh, chime in on the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, or you can also do that through the chat function. Uh, we have about maximum of 10 minutes less, uh, left because Jim has another commitment. And so we want to give everybody a chance to chime in with questions if they have any right now. Um, while we're uh, waiting for those questions to come in, Jim, um, I know we talked a little bit about um, some of the success stories. W what are some examples of public-private partnerships that just did not end up going well? Um, well, I would call them let, failures, but less than less than perfect outcomes. Let's put it that yeah. Way. Okay. So let me um, let me suggest that I have a double standard here. I'm happy to share the identities of success stories, but I'll just speak in general terms about. Sure. Um, there was, uh, here's a, a terrible example or example of something terrible that happened, a um, community, a public power utility created a fiber network uh, that uh, brought service to a very hard to reach uh, population. And then after the fact, the state enacted a law that said that entities in that state could only provide wholesale service as distinguished from uh, wholesale or retail as the community saw fit. Then um, they also legislated that wholesale providers had to make non-discriminatory access to their networks available. So I recall a meeting in which a person uh, from this community said, well, this is open access run amok. I now have 19 providers on my network. They're killing each other. Nobody's making money. Nobody's paying me. I can't raise their rates. I can't lower their rates. I can't kick them off. What do I do? Eventually what that uh, community did was to find the strongest of the retail providers and uh, help it uh, be successful through a variety of ways. Okay. A state investigation followed in which the conclusion was that this was not an arm's length relationship and condemned it as a violation of the state's uh, non-discrimination requirements the leaders of this project all lost their jobs and uh, the um, project has been struggling along uh, for many years. Now, can you think of a worse um, situation than that? Uh, and, but um, usually when there are uh, growing pains in these projects, the reason is exactly the kinds of things that Todd was talking about earlier. Uh, Miss expectations, uh, priorities that differ when you have a wholesale retail situation, for example. The wholesaler is uh, dependent on the success of the retailers and might have different views as to how much money they should be spending on, on uh, advertising, marketing, uh, where they ought to be building out or where they ought to be doing things. All of these things can lead to mismatches of expectations. And usually it is the mismatches of expectations that create problems. Um, and, and let's face it, uh, broadband projects, particularly in uh, hard to reach rural areas, 
are challenging. Mm -hmm. And those who take them on, whether they be individual providers or partnerships, have a challenge that puts a premium on communication between them and having everyone on the same page. Yep. And when that doesn't happen, the risks associated with them are greater than they might be uh, if the parties are at all points pulling together. And that's why that discovery process is so important so that you establish how you're going to communicate with each other so everyone is on the same page going in. Um, right. And, and then going in, you plan on revenues uh, yes. being lower than you'd like and costs higher than you'd like so that your model is conservative and you've got some room that in case things don't work out as well as you would like them to. We, we have a couple questions, Jim, so let's try to get to those before we have to bump off here. Um, do you find the existing utility poll owners follow the FCC's one-touch make-ready rules so that they make ready to attach new plant and it's not such a roadblock. I ask this as municipal utilities do not necessarily follow these new rules. I think I know the answer to the second part of that, but maybe discuss, I know the municipal utilities are under the FCC mandate, correct? Uh, actually, it depends. Okay. Uh, uh, mun municipalities are exempt from federal regulation uh, altogether. Um, and so, uh, and in particular, in some states, states are allowed to reverse preempt federal rules and where they have done it, it's the state rules that are relevant, not the federal rules. And so um, we, um, we found that uh, municipal, municipal entities were generally supportive of the concept of one touch make ready. Um, they, uh, prefer uh, not to have the need for several truck rolls if they can get things done in an organized sort of way. Um, I, I, I can't tell you, there's, there's not enough of a body of experience uh, since the FCC enacted its uh, one-touch make-ready rule to see how it's rolling out across the right. country. Uh, and I imagine it's mixed. It's mixed because uh, there's a lot of good to the concept, but the application of it uh, in the face of opposition from existing attachers uh, may make in some situations it not worth the battle to do it, or other situations may make it make sense for all concerned. Great. Next question. Um, are examples of pu public-private partnerships for fiber to the home systems common? And in such case, who generally owns the fiber? Um, thank you for the opportunity to steer you again to the paper that Curtis will be um, uh, sending around or making available because it deals directly with the model where public owns the infrastructure and uh, private entities use it to provide service. And you'll, you'll see uh, specific examples of how that model is used and the conceptual ideas as to what what's good about it, what's challenging about it, and so on and so forth. It's it's there's a, there's a broad range of different options that different communities have used, and most of the cases it comes down to what they can do under the law, what is in their best interests, and what they can mm -hmm. find a private partner is willing to do. Some private partners may say, "Sure, I'll partner with you, public entity, but I want to own the fiber because I want to be able to tell you what I." I want to have exactly the fiber type of fiber and equipment I need. Um, so let's do some other form of partnership. And there are others who say, well, I'd just as soon have you own it because I don't want to pay taxes on it. Right, right. Or for other reasons. Exactly. I just want to, I just want to raise my share of revenues or um, have my lease fees or whatever it is that in a particular relationship you, you negotiate reflect the risk I'm taking of you owning it and the marketing opportunity not being what I hope it turns out to be. So these are all negotiating points. And that's another thing I'd point out about the white paper, not the new one I haven't read yet, but the, the first one, I'm assuming some of the same things were in there or updated, but the discussion of shared risks 
and shared opportunities there and how you need to evaluate those going in so that everybody comes out, you know, a multi-win situation. There. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, again, the, the perception that, um, that you can just avoid the risk isn't really real. It's right. about um, how is it going to be shared? Um, you know, again, going back to those capital structures where a private company may have a seven to 10 year window of where their owners need to recoup, you know, their investments and cities are looking at 20. So how do you share then um, getting those capital structures aligned uh, in a feasible manner? Because um, that's just, that's just part of the, what has to happen. Yeah. What, one other quick one here, and I don't know if we've got time to address this, Jim, but when you got to go, you just tell me. Uh, did Amina Idaho ever gain significant customer penetration being that the customers have to pay close to $2,900 per install to own the network? Um, I can't say definitively today, but it was, it was well on its way. Uh, okay. It's very popular, um, and um, uh that becomes an asset of the property since in the, in the way that it's being paid for and um, uh, the consumers uh, do uh, own this asset and get to use it in ways that um, uh, others don't have uh, opportunity to necessarily. Uh, I would love to stay and as you know when I don't have something that's <laughs> right on the tail of things I'd stay forever and so I thank you and uh, the participants, and uh, I wish you all well. Absolutely, and if there's Jim. Anything, thank you anything so much. we can do for you, give me a holler, and uh, we'll be happy to oblige. Well, I'm sure we'll have you back because we do appreciate the information, and, and um, you're one of the guys with the biggest brains in the business. So thank you very much. We can let you move on. Um, I just want to preview our next uh, lunch and learn. I'm going to sign off, guys. You bet. Right. Hey, you thanks, back. Jim. Appreciate it. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is in January. We'll be into 2021 by then. I think we're all great, great, grateful for a new year coming in. Uh, we're going to talk about an update on municipal broadband financing. And uh, Michael Maloney with EA Davidson, one of our C-band vendor members, will be joining us at that time uh, to talk about, uh, you know, we've been a number of projects that have happened over the years and some still in the works. And we did a financing one here about a year and a half, two years ago. And so it's kind of an update on that. So Michael Maloney with DA Davidson is our uh, presenter on that. So there is the URL um, or you'll, um, I will send this URL to everybody, everybody uh, in the um, reminder uh, email that will go out through probably a MailChimp blast to our Broadband Bytes uh, group. Also, you can go to broadbandbytes.com and check out our Broadband Bytes blog, and we'll have that information on there as well. And uh, that pretty much wraps things up for today. Thank you to everybody who participated, joined us here on the, uh, this edition of our Lunch and Learn. We appreciate everybody being here, and we hope you all have a great, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.